This episode of Between the Levees is brought to you by Water Waste Council Incorporated, the national public policy organization that advocates for a modern, efficient, reliable, sustainable inland waterways transportation system. As WCI celebrates its 20th year, we serve the operators, shippers, growers, and producers, ports, skill building trades, and conservation organizations that keep America and her key commodities moving on the inland system in the most environmentally friendly and safe way among surface transportation modes. To learn more about our important work and to join us, visit www.waterwayscouncil.org. What do you know or can you speak on the history of barging in in the U.S.? Well, you know, I guess barge transportation as we know it today was the old uh, coal flats that came out of the, the Monongahela in the upper Ohio that they would bring down the river. And uh, the coal trade was probably the biggest portion of that. And those were made out of wood. Uh, their houses in New Orleans were made with barge boards. And you can research that. And uh, matter of fact, there used to be a website you could go to and find out what sections of town those homes that were built from barge boards were located. And that was the, I mean, you know, in those days, so you call that, that the forward part of the, of the, of the rake and, and, uh, the upper collision part of the square ends on the barges, the you know the headlock, and there, there was a headlock that was there. It was it was a massive log. They built the barge around, and that was part of the structural integrity of of the uh, barge because with wood you got a lot of transverse strengthening, but you did uh, or longitudinal strengthening. She didn't get a lot of transverse uh, in, in the barges today, the steel barges, the bulkheads and the combing brackets, how they tie into the into the side frames of the barge that tie into the, uh, the framing that goes underneath the hopper up on the other side. That gives you a lot of transverse lateral strength, which the uh, wooden barges didn't have. That's why you ever get barges that are 200 feet long and 35 feet wide or 300 feet long and 50 feet wide. Because, because that adaptation would just wouldn't go that far, even though they had huge pieces of timber back in those days because the forest had barely been cut at that point in time. But so all that, you know, what they would do is they would load the coal up on the uh, upper Ohio, of course, in, in, in Monongahela, but there was barge traffic up there most of the year because of steel. And they would bring them down in the floods because they had to get past Louisville where the floods of the Ohio, the falls of the Ohio are located, which is what McAlpin upper and McAlpin lower is. That's to take out that fall that was there. I would, you'd call it more a rapid uh, typically, but uh, during high water, there was plenty of water over it. It just float down past that. And they would take the coal flats or the coal barges, as they called them, down to Cairo and fill them all up and of course you bring, bring them down to New Orleans where uh, it was fuel for steamships because there's no coal anywhere around New Orleans. You gotta bring it up from somewhere else. So a lot of the original stuff was coal, but you know, barges on the lower, they moved cotton, bales of cotton and different things. For instance, coming to New Orleans, you also needed gravel. There's no gravel in New Orleans, no aggregate. It had to be brought from elsewhere too. And uh, within, cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the New York Harbor and Chicago. You had these lighter flats, which are barges, basically dumb barges, and they would move the combination of sand and gravel and cement to a batch plant where a building was being constructed so they make concrete. Um, just things of that nature. Now, uh, the federal government wanted to encourage use of the transportation system of the, of the inland waterways and the farmers in the Midwest wanted to also for exports. And the government thought it was good policy to go ahead and encourage this. So they started the Inland Waterways Corporation, which everyone referred to as Federal Barge Line. And I think ultimately it took that name and it went private, was sold to Pot Industries. And I believe the late forties, early fifties, um, and there were a few 
op operations that existed, American Barge Line on the Ohio. Um, but the big boost to the, to the barge and towing industry, I think, came with the construction of the lock and dam system on the upper river, which was during the depression and on the Illinois. And then earlier than that, they had started the uh, construction of lock and dams on the Ohio. So when you, you know, Pittsburgh to New Orleans, 900 miles on the Ohio, 900 miles on the, roughly 900 miles on, on the lower, it's 1800 mile trip. Um, St. Paul Pig's Eye Lake is 835 above Cairo. So, you know, that's another 1800 miles. It's a, it's a lot of territory. And they, you know, steamboats went all the way up to Missouri as far as uh, Fort Benton in Montana. Um, now you've got the big uh, dams on the Missouri for flood control and uh, they've turned into recreational paradises and you don't have any navigation up there anymore except I guess within within the pool of some of those dams. But um, as, it, as things developed, uh, the, there was a lot of uh, industrial stuff that was coming out of the Pittsburgh area. You had steel that was coming to New Orleans. You had coal that was going all over the place. And I guess in the late 50s, early 60s, the dry bulk side, because you got to remember the Interstate Commerce Commission was in existence at this time. So you had all these tariffs and programs that you had to go through. And if you didn't have common carrier rights, you couldn't move certain goods. But bulk goods, that were not that were moved in bulk before some date. I think it was 1938. Uh, were were considered bulk exempt, so they didn't have to. They didn't have to be uh, subject to the tariffs. But steel was not a bulk cargo. Iron ore is, and 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 coal is, and limestone is, of course, and grains and fertilizers. So what it what it developed is that. Uh, you had this kind of a, I guess you call it a, a triangular leg. And it, so stuff would come, this is typically, but you've got to remember the winter months, certain areas were closed off to navigation, all this. But they would run uh, bulk goods imported into the United States, uh, like Illumina, big movement of Illumina, into the Ohio River Valley. Uh, so it was brought in as bauxite uh, and into the to the Gulf Coast uh, using the uh, salt that was down here. They had caustic chlorine plants, and the caustic soda from the chlorine plants were enabling them to process the bauxite and extract the alumina. Then alumina becomes metal by using electricity. Didn't have a lot of cheap electricity down there, but you had some on the Ohio, and of course on the Columbia and other places. So. An example would be Illumina would go in a covered barge from the center Gulf to the upper Ohio, Ravenswood, West Virginia, uh, South Point, Hannibal, Ohio, number of different places up there. And then coal as a bulk commodity would go out of the upper Ohio into the upper Mississippi and be burned by power plants. Uh, Alma, Wisconsin was a big uh, power plant down there and they would take it into even uh, blend it with uh, Illinois coal uh, in the St. Louis market. And that would usually stack the covers then and took them up there and unload the coal. And then they would spread, the, they would take the barges in into St. Paul. And there were two power plants in St. Paul that used uh, coal that came out of the Ohio River Basin ultimately went to Powder River Basin coal, but in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, came out of the Ohio to the Allen King plant, which was on the St. Croix River. And they had no rail there. That was strictly barge service. And then the Riverside plant, which is just at the head of navigation in Minneapolis. So they would take those barges there, they would drop them in down to the harbor at St. Paul. They would spread the covers, clean the barges, and reload them with grain and take them back down south. Now, this 
trade is not hard on the barges. Um, you're using covered barges on two legs of it. You stack the covers on one leg of it. Um, it's a good utilization of equipment because basically you're backhauling all of the way. But uh, now this is a dry cargo market. I'm not talking about the bulk liquid. That's a different ball game. But there was a lot going on in the bulk liquid market also. So anyway, uh, the grain was was hit and miss. Uh, you know, we had surplus production in the Midwest, and the government was storing a lot of it. And the big problem came up every year was when harvest time came up, there wasn't any storage. You had to ship all that you could. And new grain carried a premium over old grain. So they tried to sell all the stuff coming out of the field that they possibly could. And then when that was over, if there was still a need to ship something, they would ship the older grain. So uh, the demand then would be very strong for barges and there was an enormous amount of grain involved. So the, jack, the rates would jack up in the late third and all of the fourth quarter and then die back down which seemed to fit pretty good because your navigation in the upper Mississippi River and on the Illinois and parts of the Ohio were encumbered during the winter months by ice. So uh, it, in the barge and towing business in those days, you know, if you could come out of the end of the second quarter on a break even, you were gonna have a good year. Um, you know, that first and second quarter, you tried to, have as, you tried to squeeze out as much as you could. So. Um, and 1972 started out a, a bit like that. Um, there had been a few sales of grain uh, to the Russians. Uh, Conti carriers had sold a little bit, car dealers sold a little bit. But over the uh, summer there, that first, first week in July, uh, they made the big Russian grain deal. And everything went nuts and the price of corn and everything else went up. The big thing was that you saw in the newspapers was wheat. But as Jerry Brown from Cargill used to say, wheat makes headlines. Number two, yellow corn makes barge rates. Now it's soybeans added into that. But those are the two big commodities that, that you see on, on the barges. And they're for animal feed to a large extent. A very small percentage of corn or, or Soybeans grown in the United States goes for human consumption, very, very low percentage. So uh, when everything hit like this, there was no enormous amount of storage. We had some pretty good years there for crop yields, and they were running it to the river. And so the, the prices would be strong for the grain at the beginning of the year because the Russians were buying up grain, but as you got closer to the uh, October time frame, the price was dropping because people were bringing stuff in out of the field and they weren't, they didn't have storage for it and they didn't have contracts for it. So they were doing everything, the price would drop so they could move it, supply and demand. So, and meanwhile, the United States, the barge operators were seeing this huge demand for their barging because Bar grain barges often run into demurrage, uh, particularly at discharge, at destination, and your trip times got longer. So you needed more barges to move the same number of cargo, but the cargo, the same amount of cargo, but the amount of cargo was increasing. So we were building uh, hopper barges out the, just as fast as we could. And that's when uh, Proform came up with that fiberglass reinforced uh, plastic cover that they had, um, fiberglass covers that uh, went gone through several iterations, but that's still being built and on a lot of barges. There's very few steel lift tops or steel roll covers still being built. Probably the steel's gone up so much. But in 1972, you could buy a an open hopper barge for $78,000, $80,000. And then you steel lift covers and add another 
15 or 20,000 to it. If you put fiberglass lift covers on, you're probably going to add about 10,000 to it. But the fiberglass weighed less, so you'd get a bigger payload the other end. So there was a lot of a lot of drive toward that. And they're easier to handle. You need a real, you know, if you're moving steel roll covers and you're picking them up to stack them, you need a pretty beefy crane. Not so much for uh, steel lifts, but steel lifts still weigh, you know, well over a ton. And the fiberglass lift covers didn't weigh over a ton. They were easier to handle, easier to stack, and easy to repair. Just, to, you know, you repair, you can do fiberglass repair work. For the most part, it was cheaper, a lot cheaper than, than steel. So we were building the hell out of barges and we're planting the hell out of crops. And the grain companies see this and they decide that, um, so in, 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 in 72, 73, 74, I think it was in 76, it might've been 77, called it the Great Russian Grain Robbery instead of the train robbery, the grain robbery. So what happened was the, the trading companies were selling the Russians grain, knowing that um, when the new harvest came in, the price was going to drop. They were selling grain they didn't have, and they weren't hedging signif uh, significantly against all of that. A few of them were, but uh, a couple of them got caught really bad. And the Russians kept buying and the price didn't fall and other people came in the markets and they would, the price didn't fall. So the Russians had bought what the Americans thought was the top of the market, but that turned out to be the bottom of the market. The market went up really high. They were talking about beans in the teens. So soybeans have been selling for, you know, six, seven dollars a bushel and now in the teens, 13, 14, 15 dollars a bushel. And Continental Grain had to buy in a huge exposure position they had. And of course, they're having to buy it in, so the price isn't falling against them. It's even rising against them. They got squeezed on it. And the other grain companies thought they were smart too, and it was going to happen sooner or later, but the Russians kept buying. And other, not just the Russians, a lot of other countries too, kept buying, and price didn't go down. So the U.S. company trading, not just U.S., but grain trading companies have booked this big profit earlier in the year, and it wasn't a profit, it was a loss. <laughs> so that became known as the Great Russian Grain Robbery. So it's the business cycle. Prices go up, so you produce more supply because you see the demand there. As the supply gets, as, as the supply gets there, the price is low become lower. Well, instead of cutting off the spigot, the farmers throw more grain at it to make uh, make up for their own losses internally, but they're driving the international rate down on the, on the grain. So ultimately, at some point in time, everybody's bought as much as they're going to buy, and the prices are falling through the floor. And at that point in time, government intervention comes in, and they support the price of the crops and they give low interest loans to the farmers and all this. So the farmers are able to cut back on the production. They cut back on the production, then supply is down, demand has remained consistent after it eats up the inventory that is pulled up. Then you've got demand real strong, but you don't have supplies. So then you, you plant for the coming harvest year. And if you overplant, you go through the cycle really quick. Usually they don't overplant that much but occasionally they do. And the barge business did the same thing. We overbuilt the barge fleet. We built for a barge fleet that was gonna handle these enormous capacity of, of uh, grains all the time. But, uh, you know, we're not the only place in the world that grows grain. <laughs> and uh, wheat was a big demand, but there's places in Missouri and the Dakotas uh, that you get some significant amounts of wheat. But, you know, wheat is, in in, in, in the Anglo-American world, wheat is a Canadian and an Australian crop. You know, the Ukraine uh, produced uh, a lot of wheat also, and Russia did, did too at one time, but 
they were trying to upgrade the quality of life of their people. They were running into all kinds of problems with people going abroad and seeing how other people lived and going back to Russia and getting a little depressed by the whole thing. So they were dealing with this civil unrest. Uh, I mean, it never broke out to the point of revolution or anything like that, but I mean, the, you know, the Russian government wanted to take care of the Russian people and they went about doing it the way, the way that they saw to do it. And as the United States had governmental invention, Russia intervened governmentally. And then Argentina, which had always had a big corn crop and uh, Brazil, which had always had a uh, big bean crop, they started cashing in on this too. They were producing more. So you could see how this, this business cycle is, is just causing itself to go on and on and on. And sometimes there's big demand for grain, but the demand isn't enough to push the prices up to where you'd like to see them. So your bottoms and your barges may be full of grain, but your bottom line is barely black or it's red and, and you don't want to see that happen. And then when Carter intervened with the Russian grain embargo and the Russians said to everybody else in the world, look, you can't trust the Americans at four trading partners. Uh, and a lot of people bought into that and the Brazilians and the Argentines did not hesitate to take advantage of the situation and say, oh, we're here for you. Of course, later they had their own issues. So uh, in Argent Argentina one year, they uh, put a 50, 50 cent or a dollar bushel tax on export corn. And the farmers got so mad they burned the crops in the field. I forgot what year that was, but uh, it wasn't that long ago. Um, 20, 30 years ago. But those those things all happen. And of course, then you've got this these large commercial farming establishments that have come on board and they've got all this land and they can grow all this corn and stuff. And what are they going to do with it? The meeting it, the demand for animal feed in the United States, you're eating it, meeting it abroad also. Um, but to their just, you know, serendipity, the price of oil goes through the damn roof. So everybody says, well, wait, you can make booze out of corn, make alcohol out of corn. You know, alcohol will burn. You blend that with gasoline. And man, did that ever step up the side of it. So the federal government said, well, yeah, we'll subsidize that. So ADM and Bungie and Cargill, all kinds of people are building corn processing plants. And then lo and behold, they find out that the distillers drive, uh, distillers drive, distiller grain waste product that comes out of that is an excellent feed product for animals. And it just gets the, I don't remember the exact numbers, I'm going by the seat of my pants, but let's just say that the European Union to create, to protect their own corn crop says, you can't bring anything in this country that's got more than 26% uh, starch without paying a tax. Well, when they got through with the dry distiller grain, DDG, it had a, a starch content of about 23.5%. Just got under the number. And of course, the European guys that are buying it say, oh, we can buy this cheaper. We can blend it off over here. And then there's a uh, big bump because of the distillers dry grain or dry distillers grain and corn gluten pellets, all these marvelous things that can, you know, soybeans, uh, you can only keep them in storage for so long because the bean has a lot of, of oil in it. Think of peanuts. And if you don't do something and consume it, it's going to turn rancid. But if you crush it, and you pull the oil out of it, you can sell the oil as a good feedstock and food product, and it'll go into all kinds of uh, consumer goods. And uh, you have soybean meal, which is really, really rich stuff. It's so rich that cows can't eat it by themselves. 
by itself, they have to blend it with more fiber because of, of, of the richness of the, of the soybeans. I have always been told, I don't know if it's true or not, that the only three animals to lead a whole soybean as a human being, a rat, and what's the other one? Oh, a pig. Pigs, humans, and rats. The only three animals that lead whole soybeans. I don't know if it's true or not, but at least we're in good company. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, and grain traders are smart and they uh, trade for a living. And they add value along the lines. I mean, look at the grain companies that are involved in the barging side of it. So that's logistics. And, you know, they all own tank cars for their soybean oil. And they work with tank barge companies. And they have tank farms. And they have elevators. And they have uh, gathering and distribution points. So the, the, the traders trade all the way along the, the supply chain. Now, that's not what happened originally, but uh, you know, after the the stuff that happened in the seventies, everybody got got smart about it. So when the when the seventies turned over, it wasn't the best of times for people in that supply chain, but it was a hell of a lot better for them than it was for the barge people because we had barges tied up all over the place. They say you could walk across uh, the harbor at uh, Memphis from stepping from barge to barge and I get your feet wet. So, you know, they were tied up Lake Ferguson, tied up in fleets in New Orleans, tied up on the uh, Monongahela and the Allegheny, tied up on the, the, the uh, Minnesota River below Savage. Um, they were stored everywhere. We just didn't have the, the cargo to put in because we'd overbuilt the fleet so bad. And then when that finally came out of that, um, some companies just weren't strong enough to survive, and that began the big merger situation that happened in the late eighties and the early to mid nineties, where even when I when I went into the business shore side in nineteen seventy two, the largest barge line by tonnage was the Ohio River Company because they were a coal carrier and they moved it all over the place. By revenue volume, it was ACBL, but Ohio River Company's gone. You know, Ingram absorbed them. And Ingram absorbed uh, Ohio Barge Line, which was U.S. Steel's carrier on the, on the inland water system, except for the Warrior Gulf Navigation, which was just on the Tom Bigby and along the Gulf Coast. Um, so all of these companies consolidated. The big got bigger. A lot of the mom and pop groups fell out. And it didn't just happen in the you know, you've got this same business cycle about supply, oversupply, demand, less demand, stuff like that happening in in the crude crude oil business. Also, you know where what crude oil prices have done. They've been all over the map, and to a lesser extent in the uh, liquid chemical market. Now, I say liquid chemical market because. That market is divided into a, uh, a what I would call a petrochemical business and a non-petrochemical business. That non-petrochemical business has always been a little more difficult business and hasn't had as many players. So they didn't get slammed for caustic soda, for instance. And then there were people who would really went into that niche. I think Ingram for a while really went into that uh, and they still may be in it. The, uh, 50% water, 50% caustic soda solution. But yeah, ethylene dichloride, ethyl acetate. Uh, so PVC pipe is made polyvinyl chloride and the monomer is highly carcinogenic. So you can't transport it over any distance. You kind of got to make the pipe where the mon the, the so you have a monomer and a polymer. A mon monomer is the liquid form, polymer is the solid form. So what they would do is they would move uh, ethylene dichloride and vinyl acetate, put ethylene dichloride in a barge coming out of one of these caustic chlorine plants, mixed with some petrochemicals, which is the ethylene side of it, 
they would send that to a plant. And then they would send vinyl acetate to the plant. And then the vinyl and the chlorine, we get together and make PVC pipe, polymer, the hard stuff. And the acetate and the chloride, then the uh, ethylene would make ethyl acetate, which is kind of like, it's a hard, it's a hard plastic, hard black plastic. It's often found in automobiles, interior of car, stuff like that. Uh, they had another commodity that they used to use called Bakelite, which was kind of a brown looking stuff. And uh, temperatures affected the Bakelite a lot more than it did the uh, vinyl acetate. So that's why they moved to that. But I mean, these guys come up with this ingenious stuff and, uh, and they make it work. And that kept, that, and those were small, those were 10,000 barrel barges. Those weren't these 30,000 barrel things, monsters that we see now. And um, it, it kept that aspect of the, of the market of our inland towing market in, in a relatively strong position. But as you're saying, I mean, look at Kirby. You know, Dixie Carriers turned into this huge, huge company. Um, you know, Kirby and Ingram are, they're monsters. They're, 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 they're big in the industry, but they're a big company, no matter what you put them in. They're just, they're big outfits. And I don't know, I've rambled and rambled, and I don't know how much this makes sense and how much of it doesn't. <laughs> Can you speak to uh, the development of the pricing index for, for grain? So before the Interstate Commerce Commission went away, you had these tariffs that you had to publish if you were a common carrier. And in that, you had to abide by those public rates, published rates, unless it was a bulk exempt commodity. There was a no mix rule. And I don't remember if it was three or five, but you couldn't have more than three or more than five mixed cargoes in a tow that contained a uh, common carrier regulated cargoes without all of the barges in the tow being subject to common carrier obligations and common carrier rate structure, rate published rates. So the Waterways Freight Bureau, WFB, WFB, they were under the Interstate Commerce Commission, they got an antitrust exemption and they were able to get together to uh, fix rates, I guess you'd call that, with the advice of the Interstate Commerce Commission and shippers for common carrier goods. They had this rule about the uh, about the no, no mix rule, so they had to come up with, and I don't know that how much that was enforced or whatever. So they came up with this tariff called WFB, I believe it was eight, Waterways Freight Bureau Tariff Eight, and it addressed grain, and it had a rate schedule, and that rates, if you were not involved with the Waterways Freight Bureau, you would still quote a percentage of that rate for an exempt grain loading. So Bungie calls you and says, I want to load four barges in Savage, Minnesota this week. You know, give me an offer. 120% uh, of Waterways Freight Bureau 8. So do 120%. I think the rate was eight, eight eighteen a ton, something like that. It was cheaper to move a bushel of corn by barge from Minneapolis, St. Paul to New Orleans than it was to mail a first class letter from Minneapolis, St. Paul to New Orleans. And the I think three hundred, three hundred thirty three bushels to a ton in corn. You know these different commodities have different weights. Uh, Corn is uh, 60 pounds to a, to a bushel. Beans are 40 pounds to a bushel. So it, 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 it varies. A bushel is not a bushel, not a bushel, regardless of what you use. No matter what they told you earlier, <laughs> that's not the case. 
So anyway, um, so when the Interstate Commerce Commission was dissolved, uh, the St. Louis Merchants Exchange was trading freight, or people would come in and trade freight on the exchange. And they were using that old Waterways Freight Bureau Tariff 8 as their basis. Well, the government said, this is a collusion. You're violating the antitrust because your antitrust exemption from the Interstate Commerce Commission doesn't exist because the Interstate Commerce Commission no longer exists. So St. Louis Merchants Exchange then established what they call their benchmark. And it just so happened to be damn near identical to Waterways Freight Bureau. Row eight, tariff eight, and that's the they still quote like that as far as I know. Um, you know, I haven't haven't been buying and selling freight on the grain side for a few years, so as far as I know, they're still doing it like that. And those guys, they trade, they trade positions, they trade everything. I mean, <laughs> they they're always looking to make a deal. But that's where the waterway, that's where the, the St. Louis Merchant Exchange benchmark came from. It was old Waterway Freight Bureau Tariff 8. It might have been 8A or 8B, but I, I think it was 8. Well, switching gears a little bit, testing your memory uh, yet again here. Can you tell me a list of the the acquisitions and mergers from the 80s and 90s where the mom and pops kind of dried up and sold out? And uh, I, I guess what developed into the companies that we have today? Yeah, well... Uh, Scott Shotan went out to Dixie Carrick to uh, Kirby, I guess about 80. Yeah, about 1980 and maybe 81. Uh, but, you know, Brent's were absorbed by Kirby. Um, Old Man River, the Goldings, their first company was absorbed by uh, by Kirby. Um, I think Sioux City, New Orleans, SCNO was absorbed by ACDL. Um, Tiny Carriers, ultimately. Was absorbed by ACBL. Um, the uh, High River Company got uh, waterfront services at Cairo, the big fleet there at Cairo. They had it for a while, and then uh, CGB got involved with it, and oh, it was a bloody mess. That's when the uh, thing came out about you know CGB was really owned by the Japanese, and they had barges and. Somebody turned them in <laughs> and said they got American flag vessels, Jones Act vessels, but they're not an American citizen. And then they had to restructure everything. And that's how a lot of these, uh, like Osage, came into existence in uh, St. Louis Harbor. And, um, you know, there's just so many of them. I'm trying to think of a federal barge line. They were absorbed by the Ohio River Company before the Ohio River Company got absorbed by. Uh, by Ingram and uh, Shotan, the original Shotan Transportation was absorbed by Ohio River Company, and then Scott Shotan Inc. was a, the one absorbed by uh, Kirby. There was uh, Twin City Barge. I don't know who where all they went. Uh, you know, they went into bankruptcy and got scattered all over God's green earth. Um, Bungie did really well, but ultimately they. Uh, they made a, a deal with SCF. I'm not sure exactly how that's structured, um, but SCF runs the old Bungie equipment. Or whether they own it or they have a management agreement or, or whatever, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, Wisconsin Barge Line, I believe Central Farmers, which is Agritrans, which is old Rose Barge Line. And I think Wisconsin Barge Line got absorbed by Artco. The uh, when Sparks Transportation did the old barge fleet profile on the back two pages of the booklet that they sent out, they had a list of all the major mergers that were done in the 80s and 90s, who it was and who it was that acquired them. But here's an interesting tidbit. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, American Waterways operators and the Gulf and Coastal Canal Association, their dues were tiered on 
you paid a flat rate because you were a member, and then you paid uh, dues based on the amount of equipment that you all that you operated. Well, these mergers got so many of them, and I'm talking. I mean, there's got to be fifty or sixty of them, and by the time you multiply that by the base membership fee at AWO and at and at uh, Geica, the uh, the equipment was staying around, so the new owner that picked it up was paying for the equipment, but that base fee for the company membership had gone away. Well, the, the main culprits in this whole thing, if you want to call them that, I'm not. I mean, they're just businessmen doing what they what was best for their, their company. ACBL, Ingram, um, Kirby, um, there was five of them. I can't remember who all there are. Maybe it was Artco. I'm not sure, but um, they agreed to pay more money in dues rather than to see the trade association suffer because of, of, of lack of dues because they were making these economies of scale, but it was hurting the trade associations. So there was some complaints about this and they volunteered to step up and to pay a little additional. Um, and about that time, AWO had some model bow tug and ship docking tug companies with them, but they worked closely with another association over on the East Coast. And that association had gotten smaller and weaker and they just didn't have as broad a base they merged in with AWO and brought all the ship docking companies in with them. So that's how the offshore uh, people like uh, Kirby Offshore or South Brothers or any of those companies wound up getting involved with, with AWO. And uh, some of them with, with, with Geica also, but I don't think the ship dock. There may be ship docking companies involved with Geica because Buffalo Marine is, I know, and G&H under Galveston and Crescent, ENV. So, so they're, they're probably all involved in, in, in Geica too. So those people coming in made those trade associations truly a trade association of the national tugboat, towboat, and barge industry. And it wasn't just the inland side. The inland side's still important, but you know, AWO has member companies from San Juan to Fairbanks, Alaska, or Nome, or yeah, Nome, I guess it is, and Hawaii uh, across to, to uh, the Great Lakes. And um, there was a there was a lot of acquisitions that were done, and there's always these unintended consequences that happen. So uh, now you've got Geica, who is an, and AWO, very incredibly strong organizations, bring up multitude of benefits to the member companies, not just looking out their interests in Washington and in the, in the state legislatures and things like that, and with the Coast Guard, and but promoting safety, promoting best practices, and that kind of stuff. And 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 I don't want to exclude Waterways Council Inc. either they cast a bigger net from the sense that they're looking at shippers also uh, where Geica and AWO primarily look at vessel operators. So it's a Jones Act community that they're dealing with. And the other people uh, are dealing with grain companies and oil companies, some of whom who are, are not big fans of the Jones Act, but they're looking into infrastructure and taking care of that. And basically, it's right now its footprint is the Gulf and the and the Mississippi River watershed. Um, but you know, at some point in time, they may be in Alaska and the Northwest and also and I don't know. There's there's just uh, there's needs everywhere for the services that they all provide. I think that's plenty enough, sir. Thanks okay. again. Well, I'm sorry I rambled a lot and all that. And if there's any fine. You want to fine tune any of these points? I'll see what I can remember. But anybody who wants to uh, back uh, get a little information on this stuff, the Merchants of Grain 
is a book written by a guy named Dan Morgan. It was published in the 70s. Um, I have a copy. My son, Timothy, has it in the United Kingdom. So I need to get my copy from him. And um, I don't know if it's still in print or not, but I'm sure you can buy used copies of it, if nothing else. Merchants of Grain. It's a good, it's a, it's a great book. But times have changed since then. There's another book out now called The New Merchants of Grain. And uh, a guy kind of wrote it as a, just to show the difference between the way things were done then and the tools that were employed and the attitude of the grain community versus today. And it's, uh, you read first the old one, then read the new one. And it's, it's really interesting. Come a long way, baby. Thank you very much, sir. All right. You take care, Tim. Right. Thank you. This has been a production of Where You At Studios, LLC.